Good morning, everybody. Hello. Happy Thursday. Welcome to our live show where we talk about COVID related news and research and a ton of information to equip you and your families to be healthy and safe during this global pandemic. And I am sharing with you, there's a lot of research out, uh, some in interesting information specific to COVID, some new research uh, differences between men and women and possibly some changes there. And also I, um, I'm trying to get my Instagram up. So give me one second, everybody. Uh, <laughs> sometimes internet, because all of us are online all at the same time. Sometimes it's a little difficult. So I just want to make sure that I am able to get um, Instagram up. But if we can't, that's okay. Most everybody on Instagram is following on YouTube. But most importantly, today we're going to talk about a lot of news. Um, and before we begin, I just want to highlight and welcome Instagram for all of you joining. Um, today we're going to talk about natural ways to prevent blood clots. Uh, we're going to talk about foods that you can eat and some really critical supplementation that you can use. This is partly due to some research that's come out um, specific to uh, the nature of, um, of blood thinners in a specific study based in New York um, by cardiologists and folks that were dealing with COVID patients. So this is really critical because they are seeing some benefits. So I want to talk to you about what you can do at home preventatively even without COVID, blood clotting can be very serious and it can occur in arteries. It can occur in all different vascular channels, venous um, pathways within your body, in your arm, your, your abdomen, your legs, your brain, and in a lot of different spaces. So that is going to be a very critical preventative tool. And a lot of folks, a lot of us have some predisposition to blood clotting with an assortment of uh, degenerative diseases. So if you're curious about that information, there will be a time stamp, stamp in the description box below where I uh, launch that specific detail and information to you guys after we go over COVID news. And I always try to do COVID news and then uh, the topic at hand so that you can just fast forward and click on the link down below. Yeah, so Daisy popped in a quick update on our dog. We had to take Nina yesterday to the vet Hence all the multiple interruptions from Gabriel as <laughs> I'm doing this live show and, and trying to have him be on virtual learning. Our uh, Mina, our flat coat retriever, has a, um, they think she has a sprained ankle. So she is <sighs> trying to get a retriever not to run and chase is <laughs> really challenging. But she's on some anti-inflammatories and she get some special love and treats. And she slept upstairs with us last night. So uh, thanks for everybody thinking about her. And uh, also, we need to give lots of healing energy and positive energy to the victims of Laura, uh, the hurricane that's uh, barreling through the uh, Gulf of Mexico and moving up the uh, Louisiana, Texas coastline. I know we have a lot of folks from Louisiana who watch us. So uh, let's just hold them in our thoughts and hope that they are safe and well protected. Okay, so news, the world hit 24 million uh, yesterday, um, and the U.S. is very uh, quick to approach 6 million, so we'll probably do that by the end of the week. Um, we now have 181,791 uh, fatalities. Uh, yesterday in the U.S., it was not a great day for fatalities. We had high numbers in California, Florida, and Texas. Um, California had 150. Californians died, Florida had 155 Floridians die, and Texas had 229. Those are numbers that are often reflective of positive cases from three to four weeks ago. Uh, globally, I do want to highlight some interesting news. There um, are some Indian islands um, off the coast of India and in the Indian Ocean, um, where there are tribes, very indigenous, very insulated tribes. And it's often one of these scenarios where some of these tribes are very hard for people to integrate into. And there's, I was reading a whole bunch of stories, like people, you know, they go after and, and hunt and kill poachers who try to get on their island. And they're very, very protective of the island. Turns out one of these islands, it's called Grand um, Adaman, Adaman and the uh, Nicobar Islands, 
one of these island groups, the Anaman Island, which has a population of 50, 10 individuals on this island have COVID. So somehow, some way, COVID has entered onto the island. And um, out of the 10, four have been hospitalized, six are recovering. So COVID is hitting all areas of the world. That's just one kind of instance of that. Um, here in the States, I do want to talk about <clears throat> some things that came out of the CDC. This is really interesting. And this is um, an evaluation of a flight. Now, this is not research from the CDC, but they posted it and they've um, put it in there. It's actually, a, it's, there's, it's a November issue. It sounds really crazy, but, you know, sometimes these publications are two and three months ahead. Um, so this is an article about asymptomatic transmission of COVID, SARS-CoV-2, on an evacuation flight. And it highlights a flight from Milan to South Korea and how, um, how there was transmission. They've identified specifically a woman caught COVID by using the restroom in the bathroom. And they literally break out her seating chart. Like, here's the bathrooms. This is where one person was located. These were where other people were located. Um, and the individual that, that um, they had asymptomatic carriers close to the bathroom. And they've identified that this one woman, she wore an N95 mask on the plane, except for in the bathroom. Um, and that also there were other individuals who, who developed and caught COVID from the plane. Um, but they've been able to identify and locate her transmission source because she had not used transportation to and from the airports. Um, she had been self-quarantined, minimal contact. And what they've identified is the length of time and the multiple use of the bathrooms was where she was infected. It's craziness. Um, but they have the timeline and the mar it happened March 31st was the time of the flight. They arrived the next day on the first, you know, sometimes those times, if you fly internationally, these are long flights. There's no way to avoid a bathroom on that type of flight. Um, all passengers were tested on the second and then they were tested again 14 days later on the 15th. And they basically identified there were six asymptomatic patients or asymptomatic positive cases and one actual um, COVID-19 patient that had symptoms. And the woman is the one who developed the symptoms. Um, and they, they identify like where she was seated. I mean, it's really interesting, the contact tracing. But this is up on uh, the CDC website. Um, they dig a little bit more into just the nature of um, transmission and you know what they what they've identified. Everybody was wearing N95 masks except when they were eating. And then this one individual, she took them off in the restroom. Um, so they've evaluated their body temperature and all these other you know variables. But what they did conclude was that there was airborne infection in the flight and uh, contaminated bathroom. So this is just an interesting kind of little tidbit. Um, some specific news about um, additional transmissions here in the US. Um, one of the universities, Notre Dame, is uh, being heavily scrutinized right now. Um, they have, have an overwhelming amount of cases. Um, they've gone in just a matter of eight days uh, with campus reopening up to a 16% positive case rate. So that is significant. So what that means is 16% of all the individuals who's being, who are being tested are um, positive, coming down positive, either symptomatic or asymptomatic with COVID. Um, and the, the caseload on the Notre Dame campus, and I highlighted earlier this week, it's uh, like less than, I think, 12 or 13,000 students between grad and undergrad. And um, there, the school is overwhelmed uh, with, with testing and the isolation um, factors. And they have been um, underwhelmed by testing. And so they're now talking about uh, launching randomized testing and um, are being heavily scrutinized because of the lack of messaging and the lack of testing. So they're um, a case in point of what not to do on a university campus. Uh, something else that popped up as I was researching just kind of where we're at and, you know, some more details about spread. There has been a cluster that's been identified um, from several cases in Massachusetts. 
that a, a late June bachelorette party that occurred in Rhode Island. I, I, they don't say where, but I have a feeling they probably all rented a house in Newport, which is very common. We all do that when you live up there. Um, 19 ladies went on a bachelorette party. They all rented this house. And it sounds crazy, but you can rent a house and put 19 people in it. Um, and all of them have tested positive. Some were residents of Rhode Island. Others <clears throat> live in Massachusetts. And they've identified this cluster that um, they went to a party or, or held a party, had a whole party adventure party weekend. Um, the other thing that um, is being scrutinized right now, the CDC, lots of scrutiny about that. Uh, I announced this yesterday. It was very random. I missed it on, on Monday and, and part of Tuesday. The CDC did a quick little tweet, really trying to be really, you know, blase and just whoop, put it out there of rolling back guidelines that if you are asymptomatic, you don't necessarily have to get a test, which is, it, I, I'm, it, let me say that again. The true nature of the tweet was that if you've had exposure or contact with somebody um, and you don't have any symptoms, their communication was you don't necessarily have to get a test. Um, those are the antithesis of the guidelines. And in fact, a lot of this happened when some of the leaders of the task force and infectious disease doctors were uh, not present, i.e. Fauci apparently was <laughs> getting through uh, uh, vocal cord surgery. So he couldn't even speak uh, to how terrible of an idea this was. But the CDC is getting a lot of backlash and it's now coming out that there was a lot of political pressure from, from high to roll this back because again, the more tests we have, the more people are testing positive and the nature of this is just bad. It's bad all around. But the challenge is when we don't have testing as we're seeing on, on the Notre Dame campus, it, it doesn't mean that you have lower cases. You have potentially a very bad community spread um, and folks that don't know they need to quarantine even when they're asymptomatic. And even this this sample of, you know, way back in March, people on a plane, there were multiple cases of asymptomatic, six, six asymptomatic patients. They're positive, but they have no symptoms. They wouldn't know it until they take a test. And this testing, you know, as soon as they got off the flight and 14 days later, because they're all quarantined in this country, uh, in, in South Korea, that is an example of how this works and why this country, South Korea has been able to minimize the degree of spread and why we are out of control here. So those are just examples of how that works, even when you have a situation of, you know, long-term exposure on a plane, you know, taking masks off to eat and in the bathroom, and yet testing is a critical part of that containment. Um, now, the other thing, the FDA has green-lighted um, an Abbott, Abbott Lab has a rapid test um, that it's an antigen test and it apparently can turn around very quickly in 15 minutes. It costs $5 and it does not need lab equipment. So this is a new type of test, uh, different than the Duke. I think it was, uh, no, Yale. Yale has another test. That's a 15 minute turnaround as well. But this Abbott rapid test, um, they're talking that they should be able to get millions, like 10, 15, 20 million of these tests out. And they would be at, um, point of, of like patient point, uh, point of contact. So it would be at your doctor's office or your urgent care, or it could be at universities, schools, you know, large corporations, uh, any, any company that would want to bring this in, they could. Um, so that is very fascinating in terms of underlying, there is a problem. And these labs like Abbott would be a potential resource to get us testing more people. And the cost of it is lower five points a person, you know, $5 a person. So it's not an overwhelming amount to get somebody tested, um, which is going to be critical because we need to get, we need to get this mass volume under control. Now I want to talk to you about two really cool studies. So the first one came out yesterday in the nature or, uh, magazine. Um, it was an accelerated article review. Um, it was accepted on the 19th. They just published it uh, yesterday. And um, the data was received in June. So this is, you know, predating uh, June in the summertime. But basically what they did, it's a study um, specific to um, looking at the differences between men and women and their immune response to COVID. So the title is Sex differences in immune response 
that underlie COVID-19 disease outcomes. So they wanted to identify, you know, up to the point where, you know, they were doing all this research, they could identify that men, particularly gentlemen over 50 and 60, are having a different degree of experience. Like it's, it's more fatal for men and the uh, severity, it's very different. So this actually looks at uh, the acute, uh, moderate and acute of uh, very severe cases and, and identifies different points. And so basically here are some of the differences. Men are more susceptible than women. And one of the things that we find women have more robust T lymphocytes. So we have a better immune response mechanism and we have a stronger army. So basically the, the T lymphocytes, that's this whole response mechanism to a pathogen, a foreign invader. Yesterday, if you missed that, we talked a lot about platelets and the role platelets play. They're the frontline workers to allergens, uh, any pathogen like a virus or bacteria. So this is another, these T lymphocytes are another part of the immune response. The other thing that they find is men particularly have a weak T cell activation. And if you followed a lot of my uh, content, I, you know, I talk about the thymus gland, I talk about some other ways to invigorate your T cell production. Um, men tend to have a weaker uh, T cell uh, production in response to COVID, which may benefit more men with the vaccine that the Oxford and AstraZeneca have kicking where there's a greater T cell production. So that might be one of these things where if you're a man, that vaccine might be more conducive for men, potentially than women. So these are where we're going to probably see a lot of these articles and the research coming into play in terms of the efficacy of potentially some of these therapeutics as well. The other thing that they identified was that there's a difference in the cytokine and the chemokine. These are the inflammatory responses to the virus. And men actually pr produce more cytokines than women. And they have, so these are pro-inflammatory cells. This is that immune response that turns really ugly where we start to see, you know, ac the ketoacidosis, the changes in the, the acid levels in the body, with sepsis, we, we see all the impact in terms of the blood clotting, it, it hits men differently. Um, so women have a greater higher T cell activation than men, men have um, higher uh, response of the cytokine, which is very interesting. So this talks a little bit about the disease course. And um, it, it goes into, uh, I mean, there's just a ton of, ton of, um, of descriptive analysis and uh, I'll save you kind of the, some of these charts, but they actually look at what's interesting is they look at the CD4 and CD8. This is what we know as the kind of immune response. They highlight differences between men and women. And it is very interesting. Men don't respond the same way as women do. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting find in terms of men and women. I think it, it leads us to, to acknowledge that men need to ramp up and support um, their immunity in maybe a different way than women. So now, specific to today's research, to, there's research that came out today, Journal of um, American College of Cardiology. Um, it just came out, let's see. It came out, it was published on the 4th, but it just came out the 24th. Um, they highlight um, the anticoagulation, mortality, bleeding, and the pathology among um, patients hospitalized with COVID. So it's a single health study. It's Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, 4,300 patients are part of the sample. It is not randomized, meaning they don't have a difference between people who didn't receive uh, medications versus those who did. Part of this is because we're still figuring out the therapeutics, but that is part of the next steps um, in potentially having the randomized. <clears throat> but what they identified is that um, the blood clotting nature of COVID, um, they found certain in-hospital anticoagulation efforts to be effective, meaning they would prescribe blood thinners to individuals um, as part of the need to uh, target the blood clotting and the blood clotting in the brain and the lungs. And, you know, as they were doing dialysis, those machines were getting clogged up. What they found is that blood thinners reduced the risk of death by 50%. And also the anticoagulants that were administered in the hospital 
um, there was 30% less likelihood of that person needing to be on ventilation. So the ventilation co component is potentially linked to the degree of blood clots within the lungs and why they, if they can reduce the blood clots in the lungs by putting people on blood thinners, they reduce that need for that person to need the ventilation, which also limits so much of the you know, psychological impact that they see, the, the neuro COVID also, there's that aspect where you know, they put people on ventilation. We've talked a little bit about how they'll have strokes and they don't even know it because of blood clotting. So there's a significant amount of positive impact when they're looking at uh, reduction of blood clots. So that is what today's topic is all about. And I'm going to do my little time stamp here. Um, we, I want to talk to you about blood clot, blood clot prevention, things that you can eat, foods that are very beneficial, lots of research around these foods. So I was just pulling this out of thin air. They have been studied by the cardiology, uh, the American Cardiology uh, Associations and other research um, journals and articles highlight the anticoagulant benefits of certain foods. So these are foods, if you have that history, you have family uh, history of stroke, heart attack, or even now in COVID, you've got family members who've had really severe blood clotting, there's likelihood that that might also occur with you and you might wanna pre be pre preemptive and proactive and we can do that in natural ways. And again, I have to um, preface anything I talk about with COVID, there's no cure to COVID, there's no proven uh, therapeutic right now, there's a lot of trial uh, research happening about therapeutics and, and resources. So I don't want to, you know, do, I, this is not a stamp that this is curative for COVID, but specifically when we're talking about blood clotting, blood clotting disorders, or folks that have deep vein thrombosis or any type of uh, thromboembolic uh, situation where there's blood clotting anywhere in the body, um, there are things you can do. And I have an experience um, in my clinical practice with a lot of folks that have blood clots. I see a lot of post-surgical cases. Some are, you know, necessary surgeries for cancer, you know, organ tissue removal, cancer removal. Um, and then there are the elective, you know, breast augmentation, um, body lifts, liposuction, tummy tucks, you know, the, the plastic surgery world that there are risks also with those and blood clots. And I've even had folks that, you know, have hematomas and, and there's certain kind of recognition of a hematoma and, and they need to be addressed immediately. Uh, or sometimes it can ruin the surgical incisions. So I work with a lot of folks also in the lymphatic world that not only do they have lymphedema or some lymphatic disorder, there's an underlying vascular impairment or deep vein thrombosis or some sort of blood clot. So this is very much in my wheelhouse of working with folks. And also, you know, if you are on any type of medication, you want to make sure, even with foods, especially in the blood clotting world, you want to make sure that you're not overwhelming your body with so many blood thinning uh, enhancements. And even food contains chemicals in it, as well as herbs. Um, and some of the things I'm going to recommend, you want to make sure if you are taking medication, I don't know your history, and it's best if you talk to your doctor, nurse practitioner, and also your pharmacist, especially if they're administering medication that's blood thinning anyway. So there might be some precautionary uh, measures you need to make sure that you don't eat or consume or take these certain supplements. So I want that as a caveat as well. So you guys take some responsibility on figuring out what is going to be best for you. I just don't know everybody's situation. So let's kick off blood clots can it be uh, in, in any type of vascular venous um, channel pathway. We can have arterial blood clots. You can have um, uh, vein oriented blood clots. So you can have them superficially. You can have them surface level. You can have them deep inside the body. You can have them inside any area of the body cavity. You can have them inside any organ or gland or any type of tissue, soft tissue as well. So we will often see abdominal related blood clots. We'll see blood clots in the legs and the arm. Those tend to be post-surgical um, or injury, like an injury could be part of it. Liver disease is a big underlying component. So sclerosis of the liver is enough for you to have a likelihood um, or a potential risk of blood clotting. The other thing that we see, you can have it in your heart. 
that can cause a heart episode, a heart attack, a heart failure, and we can also see it in the brain. And in COVID, um, I've talked in multiple live shows that we have, um, have had surgeons and pathologists in autopsies look at all of the organs and glands within the body and almost everyone has some degree of microclotting. And COVID is it, one of the, the dangers of COVID is the microclotting. We see that in the lung, you know, we have these little air sacs in the lung. Well, they, those air sacs get, uh, you know, a blood clot, multiple blood clots, and all of a sudden you're not able to get oxygen intake you know, the intake of oxygen, you're not able to detox out some of the harmful chemicals we need out of our body. So let me just quickly pause. If you guys are loving this information, please give me a thumbs up. That really helps support our algorithm. And I'm grateful for that. Um, so I want to talk to you about there's five kind of methods or steps that you can you would ordinarily see. So if you got diagnosed with a blood clot, usually you're going to be put on a blood thinner. So that's a medication. There's all sorts of blood thinning medications. Um, so that tends to be the, the go-to. Now, apart from uh, a scripted medication, some of the other things that might be recommended, antioxidants are very blood uh, thinning, pro, they're, they're, they're very pro blood thinning. So they're anticoagulant. So they're, they're um, there to help minimize blood clots. So antioxidants are very powerful. So we have a lot of foods that fall into that category. The rainbow obviously is a big one. Then the third are what we call anti-lipids. And anti-lipids are basically, lipid is a fat, and so they're, they're ways of getting rid of fats. So extra fat that's in the, the in fat, meaning like cholesterol, triglycerides, some of those internal metabolic fats, those can be clotting uh, or clotting factors. So that is one thing that we look at anti-lipids, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Lifestyle changes are a big factor, and there's some certain things to do in the different parts of the day that can be anticoagulant, actually. Um, and five, really a lesser known, and this is my main specialty, are en enzymatic therapies, uh, particularly proteolytic enzymes. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So first, the most important thing to prevent blood clots is to make sure you are hydrated. Uh, I think it's eight or 9% of our body weight comes from blood and blood the blood volume is based on the amount of liquid you have in your body. And so you need to ensure if you want to uh, minimize any risk, whether you have a history of it, family history, or, you know, COVID risk, you want to make sure you're hydrating really well. Um, it's no coincidence that dehydrated bodies, run down bodies, feverish bodies have a greater likelihood of blood clotting because it's, they're dehydrated. So hydration is critical. So that's number one. Number two, foods that are potent. Um, are going to be foods that are rich in K2. So that is a, a nutrient, a vitamin that is an anticoagulant, a blood clotting blaster. Um, you can supplement with K2. I have one of my favorite K2 links down below. I take that on the daily. And foods like spinach and eggs um, are, are really potent in K2. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the everyday gardening uh, herbs that you might find that are also rich in K2. Um, garlic is a powerful food for uh, blood clots. Uh, so sauteing garlic, eating it raw, uh, mincing it, garlic is critical. Also ginger, ginger and turmeric are two really potent um, herbs. And in this category, um, they have salicylate, which is a potent chemical in them as herbs that, or they're really root vegetables, that, that actually has anticoagulant properties. So that is a natural blood thinner. And again, I do um, lectures and I educate other lymphatic therapists, PTs, pharmacists, uh, nurse practitioners, folks that cater to lymphatic disorders. Um, I, I teach them on nutrition because a lot of things, you know, when we're working with patients, we only see them maybe once a week or once every two or three weeks. There's a lot that patients need to do on their own. And part of that can be potent in terms of what they're consuming. And so ginger and turmeric are always on my list of very pro lymphatic motivators, but they're also very good for minimizing blood clotting. Cayenne, cayenne pepper is also really a potent, um, anticoagulant. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of detoxes that involve cayenne, but you can flavor and, and add that spice to a lot of different things without it being too powerful. 
Um, chocolate also is another, it's a vasodilator uh, and it helps improve circulation. There's actually a study from the American Heart Association about dark chocolate. And so, you know, I'm, I love dark chocolate. <laughs> it also has magnesium. If you crave chocolate, you know, do you know that there's usually an underlying magnesium component that you need to also add into your diet. But with, with dark chocolate, one of my favorite local uh, chocolatiers, they actually will do, and they call it Mexican chocolate. They'll do a cayenne infuse, and they'll infuse cayenne in these little chocolates. And holy cow, I mean, you want a power punch for, for your blood and blood circulation, do a little dark chocolate with cayenne. Um, and it sounds awful. It actually is really nice. It has a nice little bite to it. So comment down below if you've ever consumed that. Now, another thing to drink on the daily, and you guys know for my regulars, I lived in Japan for a year. So I lived in Tokyo. I actually lived in this cute little, I call it a hut, but it was house. I was on the main train line and we had a view when I'd wash my dishes in the sink of Mount Fuji. So um, it was very frequent and I lived and worked with a the family there. Um, we would go to tea houses and we would go to, um, they call them onsens, but the hot springs, that would be like a weekend adventure. And you'd always be drinking matcha, green tea, really good, rich green tea. Green tea has chemicals in it um, that help break up blood clots. And so green tea also increases your nitric oxide levels, which is very relaxant and also preventative of blood clotting. So there's some benefit there too. you know, add in your green tea, you can drink that in the morning it could be an alternative to, you know, coffee or some of the other teas. Um, green tea has natural caffeine, but it's not the caffeine that'll invigorate and cause your adrenals grief. So I get a lot of questions about green tea. Totally fine. It's actually very calming to your central nervous system, but delivers so many, so many potent aspects. Green tea. I also love white tea. That's the kind of fresh growth of, of tea. Um, and it's oh, so good. And if you can get matcha, that's a stronger version. And a lot of the matcha is grown in Japan. They export a lot of green tea. You also get good mineral content with Japanese grown green tea. So look for that. Um, sometimes you can order online. I'll look and see if I can grab a link for you for some of my favorite. I usually go to an import store. Um, and I've, it's, I've often had my Japanese friend me, friends mail me stuff because it's so good. Um, the other thing that we find beneficial uh, are fruits that are rich, uh, fruits and foods rich in vitamin C. Vitamin C also is kind of a natural uh, blood thinner. And then also vitamin D. I'm very much a proponent of vitamin D across the board. It is a uh, steroid actually, and it's a, in the hormone category. Every cell in your body needs vitamin D to be enriched and invigorated. So that is really critical. Um, the other thing that when we talk about um, the anti-lipids, you can consume omegas. Omega-3 um, is very potent. So omega fish oil, I love fermented cod liver oil. Butter oil, I've highlighted that. I think I have that. I don't have that close by where I can show you. But butter oil, I talk a lot about that. It has K2D. Um, and Pat, she purchased both of them. And I've got that link down below. You can get from Green Pastures, the place I go to, for your fermented cod liver oil. And they add the butter oil. And I think it's called liquid ice or, um, let me see, I think I have it. Do I have it up here? No. Um, it is, it has a special name to it. Um, blue ice, blue ice. So it's green pasture, blue ice, royal butter oil. That combination is what you need to break up and get rid of the excess cholesterol. So for folks that have high cholesterol, high triglycerides, that puts you in a metabolic syndrome in a category of of risk when it comes to blood clotting. And so if you already know those values, you know, you're always kind of high, do add in those aspects. Now, omegas, you want to clear it with your doctor, especially if you're on a blood thinner. Um, they are known to thin your blood because they're highly potent in that category. Um, and you don't want to have too thin of a blood because you can have bleeds. And so it's very critical that you, you, you are cautious and do your research, talk to your clinicians, and make sure that all of the items are okay. A lot of times your doctors will say, I don't know. Um, and sometimes when they don't know, they will tell you don't do it. Um, and others will say, you know, it's best to ask your pharmacist. The pharmacist, honestly, 
They're the people who are interacting day to day with all of the vitamins and nutrients and herbals all of us are taking and the medication. And they also have databases that they can log into to check and reference contraindicators. So if you're taking an herb, um, homeopathy doesn't really engage in the same way with medication as herbs do, but definitely, and you know, the food groups, spices and things like that, they're herbs. Um, they will have reference tools that they can check. And it's, it's very powerful. And sometimes you can even call them. You don't even have to go to the pharmacy. Um, the other thing too, lifestyle changes. One of the most impactful things you can do, because when we're sleeping, our blood gets a little sluggish, um, is to get up and exercise and reinvigorate your system. And that can be anywhere from exercising, doing yoga, doing kundalini breath work, getting the blood flow going, um, but movement more in the morning, being a morning person and getting your body active actually lowers the risk of blood clots. So that is kind of an interesting statistic, but morning activity is much more powerful in helping break up any of the congealed. And it sounds crazy, like congealed blood, but some people have thicker blood and, uh, with COVID we see really greater thickening that it clogs all of those, um, the, um, the, uh, nephrology, the, um, those machines that they're clearing and, and helping the body detox. Um, so that is something that is important. Also, when we talked, I think last week about contrast therapy, where you do hot and cold, that's a, that's another option. So you're showering, you're showering in hot, then finish your shower in cold for two or three, four minutes that's enough to get the blood flow because you're, you've got the warmth, it moves your, your blood to the extremities and then the cold moves it back. So you actually are, are moving your blood flow. Now, the last and final is honestly one of the most amazing potent forms of helping people break out, break down fibrins. And, and this is something that you don't really hear a lot about, but blood clots are a combination of uh, it's like sticky blood. If you've ever eaten sticky rice or anything that's kind of sticky, like Rice Krispie treats, <laughs> you know, when you make them, it's like, oh my gosh, ooey gooey. And by the time you're like really getting down to the end of like that batch where you're trying to put them in the pan, it gets really hard. That's what thick congealed fibrous, fibrin rich blood looks like. And that's what a blood clot is. It is just a lot of fibrins like proteins, it's actually a dense connection, they're connectors, and they they pull together all these red blood cells, and then they end up getting bigger. Within that become, you can have uh, arterial plaque, you can have cholesterol, that all gets in there. One of the ways the defense mechanisms that we can use that is very potent are enzymes. And there's, it, there are different categories of enzymes, we have metabolic enzymes, we have proteolytic enzymes, we have digestive enzymes. These are not digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes simply help you break down food you're consuming. We level up to the metabolic enzymes and proteolytic enzymes actually help break out and break down dense proteins, fibers that occur from metabolic processes within your body. One of the most known kind of metabolic processes is a healing function of scarring. So if you have like I had over here, it's really hard to see, but I had a big, big, uh, really pain in the butt type of mole where it was around my bra strap. I had it removed like 15, 17 years ago. And you know, your body is depending on what type of surgery or, or kind of incision you have, you will get scarring. Um, you can tell what type of scar you are and the degree of density of fibrin matter based on the how even and white the scar is. If it's pink, if it's raised, if it doesn't look like it's healed, it's a little wonky. It even doesn't, it doesn't feel flat. It feels kind of thick. That is um, thicker scarring. And we call those keloids. We can use this, these enzymes also to break down the scarring as well. So this, again, this is my post-surgical work. I do a lot of scar reduction naturally and help prevent that with folks that are have you know, that have had full body lifts because people have lost a ton of weight or folks that are doing, you know, all different surgeries. When we're looking at blood clots in our bloodstream or in any venous arterial uh, pathway, there is a degree of fibrin matter that we need to break up. When we break up the fibrin, 
we are better equipped at, at rearticulating the blood flow and opening up those pathways. K2 has a function, omegas have a function, but the most important function is actually what we call fibrin defense. And so this is a particular supplement and it, it, is, it looks like this, and these are taken on an empty stomach um, and it is a whole bunch of enzymes. You might be familiar with them, um, it has serapeptase, it has lipase, which is a fat, it breaks down fat. So again, that whole cholesterol component and natokinase and natokinase, that's a Japanese, that's derived from J Japanese natto. That's a particular food. It's fermented bean paste, stinks. <laughs> I never found, I didn't acquire a taste for that, but it's really healing and very potent. And in fact, Japanese have really low instances of blood clots, heart disease, heart attacks, because of the natto that they're consuming. Um, the other thing that we find in here is a very rich protease, a protein enzyme breaking uh, their assortment of, of, of uh, protease, three different types that actually break down these dense protein fibers. So we combine natokinase, serapeptide, serapeptase, and lipase with other natural enzymes like bromine, bromelain, uh, papain, amla, CoQ10. This particular supplement is potent and they actually have dosing. So there's maintenance, two to three capsules a day, uh, increased support. You can take a little bit more. And then when we're doing therapeutic, like we're actually dealing with the DVT and I work closely with vascular surgeons, heart doctors, and uh, the different medical providers that are in an in individual's care practice. These can be very powerful at breaking out those fibrins. So it's the stuff that's sticky. Those sticky bonds are what this fibrin defense actually breaks out. It literally digests and breaks apart those enzymes or, or the enzymes break apart those dense fibrins and it just breaks them apart. And now you don't have the stickiness. And so that reduces the likelihood of blood clotting. So that is a real kind of broad scope of all the different things that you can do to prevent blood clots. Also, you can therape therapeutically use many of these. Um, also, you know, get clearance with your doctors, your nurse practitioners, surgeons, whomever you're in the care of. If you're being medicated, make sure you talk with them and your pharmacist. But these are some options for you to address some of the blood clotting underlying conditions that lead to blood clots as well as blood clots themselves. Now I know I have a lot of questions, but I also want to, because I have a lot of you on here now, um, I want to let you know tomorrow I'm going to be taking the day off. Uh, I'm pulling Gabriel from virtual school and we are going to have an adventure tomorrow. Usually I have Q and a live Friday, but yesterday was a really tough day for him. He just was not, he was not focused as you guys saw. He came in, I think four or five times. He's super cute, but we need to kind of, we need to get him, we need to kind of take them away and bring them back. And so we're going to go to the zoo first thing when they open, apparently it's slower in the morning and uh, super safe. Um, had lots of calls with the zoo. So we're going to be doing that. So you won't see me live tomorrow, but I'll be back on on Saturday. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, Instagram seems to be buffering a little bit uh, in JL Nina pulmonary edema. If you do, you have a blood clot in your lung. Uh, can you get it to go away on your own? Yes, you can. So um, everything L L J or JL Nina, everything I've talked about today is it, that's meant for this. Um, so if you, if you just tuned in, do watch on the, on the replay. Um, and it, it is very common. I mean, I, I, the first time I had an experience with blood clots, um, was not personally, but it affected, uh, a friend of mine from elementary school. Her dad had a car accident. And from that, the injury, there was a blood clot. And five or six days later, he had the blood clot, it moved and he died. And I remember, I think I was in fourth or fifth grade and it was really shocking. I was like, how does that happen? You know, a simple car accident. And so that is something where you can have these and not even be aware of them, you know, starting to develop or the thickening. Um, and so this is why these items like D3, K2, you know, nutrients like green tea, dark chocolate, cayenne, and then the, the fibrin defense, the natokinase, all of these proteolytic enzymes, and as well as contrast therapy and waking up, moving, exercise being the most critical, and moving your blood, 
this is really a preventative measure and it's a lifestyle. It's not something you want to do temporarily. You want to do this longer term um, because it tends to be one of these things, you know, you want to, you just want to avoid having to deal with any of that. So just do this every day. Um, and it's very, very powerful. Donna is drinking green tea. Good for you. I love it. Um, and let's see. Um, Let's see, JL, Nina, a uh, question about wearing compression hose. Uh, yeah, so compression stockings, that actually is partly vascular, partly lymphatic. Um, you know, that one vein issue, I always have like for two or three months in the summer, in the last two years, it's popped up this one vein. Now it's going back into hibernation for some reason. But um, I wear compression compression. Um, stockings, especially when I'm on my feet a lot. And that's also something too, depending on activity levels and type of job, you know, people can develop blood clots from the lack of activity, you know, sitting in a seat, being at an office chair or being on their feet for a lot of, you know, the time. So there's a lot, a lot of different reasons. There's, you know, genetic elements, there's, um, you can get gene tested. There's some folks that have that predisposition. Um, so it's important to know. Um, but yeah, this is going to be this whole series here, all of the different things that I highlighted um, will be very potent and very powerful. And so it's really, really critical. Um, the enzyme supplement, everything is in the link. So you'll find it. Um, I've posted the, the links below. Um, so you can grab that. And I see Deb W. Last year, my grandson had pain in his leg and the diagnosis was that he had blood clots from his hip to his ankle. He's on medication. Yeah. And that is something where a lot of people have that occur and there's a multitude of reasons, um, you know, and that is something where we don't always know something's happening within because we can't see it. And it usually gets to a point where, you know, they have pain, swelling, and they're like, what is going on? They get a Doppler and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, you've got a big blood clot or multiple blood clots. Um, so, and he's 27 and it's something he should expect for the um, is it something you should expect for the rest of his life? It all depends. I mean, it depends on what his lifestyle has been. Um, you know, alcohol consumption is not good. 20 year olds generally are consuming alcohol. Sometimes they're not exercising as they should, but then there's predisposition. So definitely have him check. There's a blood clotting disorder. And if they haven't done that, they should, you know, sometimes you have to ask to so say, you know, is this something that's I'm predisposed to? Like, is there a gene defect? And there are some folks that have that. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, but you know, for a lot of folks, blood clots, they can come and go. Um, but you know, if you'd follow all of the right processes, you eat clean, you know, um, also deal with emotions because emotions are a big part of our health or, you know, mind body connection is very strong. Um, and, you know, releasing some of that you know, if you found, feel bound up or, or you're holding on to things, release. Uh, that's good for your lymphatics. It's also good for your blood flow. Um, yeah, so we were very excited by the zoo. They apparently like the way the zoo is set up. I, I mean, I spent 25 minutes on the phone with the guy who's so great. He's like, we know moms are really cautious and we haven't had any situation. And they're going to be cleaning everything and they clean all of the banisters and everything that you might be touching, which, you know, we're not going to be. But we're going to enter one way. There's a particular loop that we make, but our zoo particularly has a new Africa um, exhibit. And so the elephants, the rhinos, um, and then we've got giraffes and zebra. Um, but the highlight for our zoo, the Atlanta zoo has, um, we have um, pandas. And so um, they have a relationship with China and I, I have actually been to the area in China where they have the panda, you know, they have the great panda uh, clinic and center, um, which, by the way, you can you can check that out. It's online and it's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Gabriel School actually has a TV screen and they will they'll put on the pandas. And so you see them playing. And it's really fun. Um, so he's been asking and um you know, it's going to be, it's our, it's the only adventure we've had outside in any type of social setting. Um, but you know, they require a mask cause it's in Atlanta. So it's actually South of the city. So we're going to wake up really early and we'll be out and about and, uh, try and make it fun for him. But I appreciate you guys, uh, letting me take a day off to 
kind of enrich him. He's been working really hard. We have the school in the morning and then we have a one-on-one tutor and he, we're seeing lots of good improvements. It's just a lot to digest. And so, uh, you know, everybody needs a mental break. So we're taking a mental health break tomorrow, both of us. And uh, I'll probably post a ton of pictures on Instagram. So do follow me on Instagram if you guys don't. Um, okay. So Marina says, if my factor... Eight is high, 1.79. Can I reduce it naturally by using all the supplements? Yes. So that is, so the factor that Marina is referencing is that clotting factor. Um, You know, there's, we definitely have a lot of ability to control this on the shore. I have to think about that. Um, I try and have it just be Friday. I try to have consistency with the scheduling. Um, Let's see. I stand and will not sit. And that's where I feel the pain. Yeah. A lot of people will feel pain definitely depending on um, how their body's holding. Um, Okay. So Instagram's buffering some more. Um, Yeah. We love, we love the pandas. The one thing the inside exhibits like the reptiles, which I'm totally fine not seeing that's closed. I don't like reptiles. Um, What about swelling? Can that ever go away? Um, well, uh, you know, Jay, El Nina, I think you need to probably see a therapist, like a vascular surgeon or, um, you know, vascular doctor, or, um, possibly look at and then check out edema, lymphedema. That's probably one of the things you might be dealing with. All right. And again, I don't know your situation, so I have no idea, but, um, that would be something, but yeah, so Jana, we will definitely, we have, um, they have some really unique things they've, Oh, and they have like an excellent gorilla exhibit. Like we have tons of gorillas and they've got the silverback gorilla and, and it, you can get really close to them. It's really kind of freaky. Like this one will sit up on a rock and just stare at people. Um, but they always have lots of little babies and they're always running around and being silly. Um, and then we have a uh, tiger. We have a snow leopard. Um, and they also, they've just added, I think white rhinos. There's a new, new animal that they brought in that we'll be seeing. Um, and then they have a ton of birds. We have a bald eagle and, um, but yeah, the African exhibit, we, we, I grew, I, Gabriel's grown up like in Tampa, our zoo in Tampa has has been voted like one of the best zoos for moms. They have like four or five nursing centers. It's awesome. And it's great because it's huge. It's spread out and you can do this loop and you're like walking three to four miles. Um, but they always have like act like they feed them all in the morning. So you could see, you could get really close and we'd see the rhinos and then we have tons of babies like baby giraffe and zebras and elephants. And we were there during world elephant day one time. And so it's so cool. So he's grown up going to the zoo and it is definitely something we have missed greatly. So we're going to do that. Uh, I'm hoping we don't deal with Atlanta traffic. Like it will take us probably an hour to get there. Um, so yeah, the, the, the gorillas are really cool. Um, and we don't have penguins. We did in Tampa, we had the, um, warmer weather penguins and they're cute. Um, so lots of fun things to look at. Um, but yeah, so as far as the Q and a Saturday, probably not, I'll just probably do Q and A's on Friday and just do a regular show tomorrow. And, um, you know, I have to figure out if this is going to work the live still, it's just, it's been really hard to kind of juggle all of it. They start at eight and it's hands on. (laughs) So, um, but yes. Okay. So friends, I hope this was helpful. Please do give me a thumbs up, hit that thumbs up button. I'd love to see a lot more and give me a heart uh, like if you enjoyed this content. The other thing that is helpful is when this does get all articulated, I'll post all these links for today. This particular um, article about the um, uh, Mount Sinai blood thinner reduction of of risk, that that will probably make a lot of news. Um, So definitely do comment on the video. Give me a like, hit the share button. I'm grateful for that. And so I will see you guys Saturday. Saturday morning, I'll be back on live at 9. And, um, uh, I, I'm excited. I'm excited for a little day off and an adventure and cross our fingers that we have no challenges with traffic because apparently Atlanta is functioning. Like we're back to normal and we're not. So anyway, have a great day, everybody. Bye Instagram, bye YouTube. Thanks Pat. And it was great to see everybody. 
and have a good day. Bye.